Thanks, everybody, for joining us for another uh, Bible study this week. Uh, we're very excited to have whoever you are here, uh, whether you're walking as a child of God, walking holy in his statutes, or whether you're seeking him. Um, we thank you for uh, joining us. Um, this is going to be a study named The Victory of Christ, and it touches on the humanity of Christ and etc. It's a very interesting study, and it must be understood you know, a lot of people do not understand, uh, you know, how the one true God himself could walk as a man on earth. But uh, here we have our dear brother Aaron going to explain that to us. So, brother, over to you. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Um, we read in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 to 8. Let nothing be done through, through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And, con and considering the phrase here, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. The, the context of this is stating that Christ humbled himself in his humanity, in his incarnation, like we read about in John 1.14, that the word that existed with the Father at, from the beginning, um, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Christ in humbling himself in his humanity, he, he lived as an actual man lived. Despite the fact that equality with God is something which he possessed. The rights and privileges which God has by virtue of the fact that he created all things and rightfully owns everything fully belong to Christ as the word of God in the second person of the Trinity. And yet he put those rights and privileges aside in taking upon him humanity. Though retaining these would not have been robbery. He did this in order to do the will of his Father and accomplish our redemption. This is mysterious for sure. Um, but another scripture, 1 Corinthians 15, 21 says, For since by man came death, by man also, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. And in another scripture, Hebrews 2, 9 and 10, we're told, um, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. For it became him, or it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. To do the will of his Father and accomplish his mission, Christ had to live a perfect life as a man and die as a man, to be the perfect sin offering who could truly make an acceptable atonement, and indeed taste death for every man. He had to be a perfect sin offering. And to be that he had to overcome temptation as a man, which necessarily involved living in a human body with the basic limitations which all, which all humans are subject to by virtue of their humanity. Um, it's only logical then, then, and the testimony of Scripture as a whole bears witness to this, that Jesus in running his, in, that Jesus in running his race to accomplish what he was sent by the Father to accomplish, would have had no advantages over Adam in the garden in doing this. Again, 1 Corinthians 15, 21, For since by man came death, by man, also, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. Jesus actually had it much harder than Adam due to the much more difficult and complicated circumstances he had to overcome in the midst of in order to be faithful. There was obviously a great price to pay, and it was a tremendously great thing overall, and that's to say the least. Um, to reverse the curse brought on by Adam's sin, which was committed, Adam's sin, which was committed in, was committed in very ideal circumstances. Um, so for, for Christ to reverse that curse, he had to overcome with no advantages over Adam and actually in much worse circumstances than Adam had, um, due to the fallen world that, and, and all the problems that had increased, um, in the world um by the time Christ had, had come um there is never a truly good legitimate reason to sin but there are but there still are reasons to sin human desires passions and goals etc combined with the suffering 
involved in not acting upon those whenever pursuing them would be unlawful before God, leave people with plenty of reasons which they can produce to attempt to justify sinning. Remember 1 John 3, 4, sin is the transgression of the law. I don't believe there will be temptation like this in heaven for those who are ultimately for those who are ultimately saved. But obviously there is temptation on earth. That is especially true since the fall of man, but it was even true before the fall. The Garden of Eden before man fell was much closer to heaven than the world fallen man lives in now, but it was sure not heaven. And Christ in his mission to restore man from the fall had to face and faithfully endure the trials of earth as a man on the earth, in, in a fallen earth. And this had to happen in the, in the environment of earth after man fell and was kicked out of the garden, which, like we talked about, is, is, a much, is much, much less conducive to faithful, righteous living than the world before the fall. Um, if you take nothing else out of this study, take out of it that Jesus didn't not sin because he was above temptation. He rather never sinned because his perfect character caused him to choose righteousness at all times despite much real temptation to do otherwise and much actual suffering involved in 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 his choices to resist temptation um and that's not even to mention how making righteous choices for him and for those who would follow him often brings on harder choices which involve yet more suffering to make the right choice in and this not only in regards to Christ is not only in itself as great a wonder as anything on earth can be, it also ultimately means when understood in its proper light, that we each have as great a help to watch we each have as great a help available to us to walk righteously as we could ever hope to have in terms of the help available. And that also leaves us with no excuse ever to su to succumb to sin. The book of Hebrews is a book of scripture which especially emphasizes these things. It begins on um, reading from Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 to 9. God who at sundry or various times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by a son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and, up and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again when he bringeth him the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the Son, he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Um, iniquity is lawlessness, for sin is the transgression of the law. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Jesus really had to demonstrate as a man his, his utter love of righteousness and utter hatred of lawlessness in order to redeem us and be the captain of our salvation. Jesus said in John 6, 38, For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And by the way, this is also a great rebuke to the oneness people who deny the Trinity and say that Jesus and the Father are one and the same person. One person cannot have two different wills. And then we see another heresy rebuked in the verses that we're about to look at, sometimes called docetism, even though many who believe this concept don't call themselves docetists. Docetism is a concept that Jesus didn't have an actual physical body, but that his sufferings were only apparent. It's a Gnostic concept. The Gnostics said the physical world is evil and and the, the, anything spiritual is good, basically. So for them to promote their heresy they had to say that jesus didn't have an actual physical physical body he didn't really suffer physically but we see that concept rebuked often in scripture um one example would be just in the next chapter of hebrews chapter 2 in verses 14 to 18 um they actually just um almost directly following the passage in hebrews 2 9 and 10 which we've already looked at so hebrews 2 14 to 18 
for as much as for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood. Um, and we'll see in a few verses that yes, Jesus was made human in all things. He himself also likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behoved him, it, it was fitting and appropriate for him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to secure or come to the aid of them that are tempted. So how, so how then do people say that Christ wasn't tempted? Or how do some say that temptation was easy for him to overcome because he was God? His character was perfect and his, and his willingness to suffer for righteousness was absolute and utterly unconditional. Yet he still had to suffer to do righteousness. He still had to overcome temptation as a man. When he was tempted in the wilderness by the devil, that is said because it was truly temptation. Anyone who has been brought to extremes when it comes to hunger, or pain, or loneliness, or possibly in being deprived of other things which an individual particularly values, there is a natural tendency to be willing to do just about anything to get out of such circumstances. Or anyone being given a chance to get out of an opportunity, um, Said it. anyone being given the chance to get out of a duty which they see as particularly um unpleasant it is um it is very difficult not to take such an opportunity to get out of an unpleasant duty christ was not relieved of this of this difficulty um so so when so when satan tempted jesus in the wilderness um Jesus um Jesus really had to had to resist his temptations um he was um he had to um he had to reject Satan's advances which would have relieved him of the incredible momentary difficulties that that he was facing um, history is filled with stories of insane things people did in moments of extremity, even Bible history. <clears throat> Unless someone in such moments loves the right choice to the point where that they are willing to suffer immensely to make it, then doing lawlessness or sin is inevitable. Those who deny Jesus' humanity and how he was tempted in all points like as we are, and needed to overcome sin of him as a man, they rob him of the glory he is due for his sufferings. And they also rob the Christian or the potential Christian, the one who considered being a Christian, of the greatest help and encouragement at their disposal um, to run their own race faithfully in doing the will of God. So we're told then along these lines, um, and this is right in, in Hebrews chapter 3, right after um, Hebrews 2, 14 and 18, which we we recently read. And remember, there's no chapter breaks in the original, so that passage goes right into this hebrews 3 1 to 6 wherefore holy brethren partakers of the heavenly calling hebrews was a book written um to baptize christian church members um consider the apostle and high priest of our profession christ jesus who was faithful to him that appointed him as also moses was faithful in all his house for this man was counted worthy of more glory than moses Inasmuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is builded by some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily or truly was faithful in all his house as a servant, for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ is a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold the, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto unto the end. So Christ is not only our greatest example of faithfulness to God and over temptation, he is the one whom all things are for and whom we should ultimately live to. And he also lives now to help us overcome sin and live acceptably to God when we come to him on his terms. There is not a temptation we might face which Christ does not understand our own weakness in facing, nor a temptation we might face which he has not overcome himself, at least in principle.
it says he was tempted and we're about to read how he was tempted in all points like as we are um doesn't mean he faced every single individual trial a human can face that that would be impossible but in in principle the things were tempted by he's faced something he, he's faced something that um that he can relate to something in that area in that same basic area so we read not too long afterwards in hebrews 4 14 to 16 seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens jesus the son of god let us hold fast our profession like we said hebrews is talking about a christian profession because this was spoken to those who really had such a profession like we saw in hebrews 3 1. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Um, it's impossible for Christ to not be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy, and find grace to help in time of need. Um, there are still aspects to Christ's own suffering. Though Christ can relate to every temptation we might face, there's our aspects to Christ's own suffering to overcome temptation which we cannot fully understand or appreciate. Resisting temptation faithfully can bring advanced temptations that are more nuanced and tricky to overcome. Some who are listening have known the, tri the tricky issues which doing right can consistent, consistently can bring, as well as the opposition from the world sometimes associated with that. Not, but yet none of us have ever known or will ever know this on a scale which Christ did as a man. He had to go to lengths to never give in to sin which are not only totally foreign to sinners, but even beyond the comprehension of the righteous. And we will soon get to the vast contrast between the righteous and the wicked, which I'm not trying to minimize by saying what I just said. I believe the closing verse of John's Gospel, which is also the very last of the four Gospel accounts, is dealing with this truth. John 21:25. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. If we knew every length, if we knew every length which Jesus had to go to in every way he had to suffer in order to do the will of his Father and 100% obey the law of God, it would be more than we could handle. And yet, as we'll talk about shortly, surrendering to him and following him diligently to do the will of God and resist sin, like we indeed need to do to profit from his redemption, will grant a person better insight into what Christ suffered as, I, as they walk forward on his narrow path. New heights and depths of Christian experience and going forward on Christ's narrow way which leads to life will bring glimpses of this. Um, truths related to such glimpses can be see, can be things which even some real Christians um, cannot bear or comprehend too well. And I believe this is related to how um, it says in Hebrews 5.14, But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Um, and, I, and there's much related significance in these verses. Um, Philippians 3.7-16. Paul, as a mature Christian, nearing the end of his life, said, But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yes, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law. That means... Is referring to the sacrifices of the Mosaic law, which in themselves cannot bring atonement for sin, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, would I follow after if that I may apprehend that, would, that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore as many as be perfect or complete, in this context be thus minded, and if in anything ye be otherwise minded, 
God shall reveal even this unto you. Speaking speaking of those who have the right aim and have things they're unconscious of, um, God that aren't consistent with that aim, God will bring those to their attention as he sees fit. Um, nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. And that's what we ought to do, whether our Christian experience has made us ready for strong meat at the moment or not. But my point in bringing these verses is that walking in this way and having this attitude, um, Paul talked about um, pressing toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He's talking about that I, as that happens, he's saying, I, I know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings. I'm, I'm becoming more acquainted with what he suffered by, by what he is bringing me through and following him on the path of righteousness. And so whether th that should be, knowing him in that way should be our, our goal and whether that has brought us to the point where um there are high and deep things of the christian life that we can um properly appreciate or not walking in that way will um will put us on a path that such things will faithfully consistently walking in that way will put you on a path where you will get a glimpse of better of what Christ suffered in order to be faithful to God. So like John 21, 25 describes Christ's great accomplishment of righteousness as a man in a, succinct, in a succinct or short way without going into detail. It is much the same with his, with his suffering associated with his um, doing righteousness in the various situations he overcame in. Um, and that's especially so regarding his suffering and making the atonement for our sins on the cross. The Bible could go into great deal in, in the Bible could go into great detail to express how horrible it was, but there are certain things which words cannot come close to fully expressing. We do know that physical sufferings alone could not make atonement for sin. Christ in his humanity had to be cut off from his father and his soul in order to be an adequate offering for sin and for the blood that he shed to have the necessary significance in the context of redemption and entire life poured out to God. Leviticus 17, 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh atonement for the soul. Uh, see especially also um, Isaiah 50 through 10, which speaks of Christ's soul being made an offering for sin. The pain of the body can be unbearable, and crucifixion would have to be a candidate for the greatest way to inflict pain upon a person and cause them a soul conscious torturous death and pain of the soul can be a lot worse than physical pain and the nature of Christ's pain in this must have been excruciating and then you combine the pain of the body on the cross the cruelty of his enemies and the pain of the father the pain of the soul and the father turning away from him as he was made an offering for sin think of Abraham taking Isaac to the altar with the fire and the knife to slay him, which was obviously a type of what the father's relationship to the son would be when he was dying as a sin offering. No words can fully describe all this. Um, yet perhaps the best hint were given about how awful what Christ suffered on the cross was, as well as insight um, were given in, of his zeal to do his father's will. Um, it's seen in his conflict and agony about going to the cross when he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane very shortly before his arrest. Matthew 26, verses 36 to 44. Um, then cometh Jesus with them, his disciples, unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me, or wait here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the, unto the, and he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, 
that ye enter not into temptation, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he knew this firsthand, since he partook of flesh and blood. He went away again a second time and prayed, saying, O my father, if this cup may not pass from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. This, this is his human will in, con in conflict with his father's will and him surrendering to the father, because he would have chose if it had been up to him to not, not have to go to the cross. And he came and found them asleep again, his disciples, for their eyes were heavy, and he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. You read in another gospel that when he was praying in the garden that there was um, drops of blood coming um, from his forehead due to the agony that, that he was in. A very, very rare thing that I believe has been proven scientifically to to happen on very, very rare occasions in certain circumstances when people are in great distress. Maybe the best descriptions of what Christ experienced as he was dying in the cross are seen in Psalm 88 and Psalm 22. A lot of insights about his life are, are seen in Old Testament prophecies, especially the Psalms. In Psalm 88, O Lord God of my salvation, I have cried day, to, I have cried day and night before thee. And to say that Christ experienced many day, days worth of affliction in one day would be an understatement. Let my prayer come before thee. Incline thine ear unto my cry, for my soul is full of troubles, and my life draweth nigh unto the grave, or near unto the grave. I am counted with them that go down into the pit. I am a man that hath no strength, free among the dead like the slain that lie in the grave, whom thou rememberest no more, and they are cut off from thy hand. Thou hast laid me in the lowest pit in darkness and the deeps. Thy wrath lieth hard upon me, and thou hast afflicted me with all thy waves, Selah. Thou hast put away mine acquaintance far from me. Thou hast made me an abomination unto them. I am shut up, and I cannot come forth. Mine eye mourneth by reason of affliction. Lord, I have called daily upon thee, and I have stretched out my hands unto thee. Wilt thou show thy wonders to the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise thee, Selah? Shall, the, shall thy loving kindness be declared in, thy, in the grave, or thy faithfulness and destruction? Shall thy wonders be known in the dark, and thy righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? But unto thee have I cried, O Lord, and in the morning shall my prayer prevent thee. Lord, why castest thou, Lord, why castest thou off my soul? Why hidest thou thy face from me? I am afflicted and ready to die from my youth up. Will I suffer thy tears? I am distracted. Thy fierce wrath goeth, thy fierce wrath goeth over me. Thy tears have cut me off. They came round about me daily like water. They compassed me about together. Lover and friend, hast thou put far from me? and mine acquaintance into darkness. Psalm 22, verses 1 to 21. And we know, we know that many things said in Psalm 22, the gospel writers applied to Christ, and it's, it's really obvious anyways. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my ruin? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season, and am not silent. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee, and were delivered. They trusted in thee, and were not confounded. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men, and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have compassed me, strong bulls of Basham have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths, as a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, that is melted in the midst of my balls. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Um, very interesting description of a man being crucified before crucifixion was even um, known, at least among the Jews, when David wrote Psalm 22. Verse 17, I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture and my clothing. But be not thou far from me, O Lord. O my strength, haste thee to help me. 
Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast turned me from the horns of the unicorns. And we know that the rest of Psalm 22 um, goes on to foretell Christ's resurrection and its glorious consequences. Even while on the cross, Christ chose to do the will of God and faithfully executing his duties at this time before God and men. He could have taken the wine mingled with myrrh, which was offered to him by the soldiers, and that would have dulled his pain some. But he refused to do this due to his need to be alert to do his duties. He took care to speak and act in line with the law of God, which led to the conversion to righteousness and, and the salvation of one of the thieves who was executed with him. Um, he made arrangements for the care of his earthly mother. Um, he basically appointed his disciple John to care for her going forward. Um, and I'm sure many, many other things not recorded in the Gospels. This was all in spite of the shame he was experiencing and the extreme difficulty of focusing, of focusing his mind due to the spiritual, emotional, and physical anguish which he was simultaneously experiencing. His cry, it is finished, in virtually his final moment, was no mockery. Jesus had an excruciatingly difficult task in completing the ministry on earth which he was sent to complete. Since this is so, it can truly be said that he overcame. Victory in a struggle or a conflict is the very definition of overcoming. And the concept of overcoming without a struggle or a conflict is a mockery and a joke. Christian suffering is not suffering to atone for sin, and to attempt to do this would be antichrist, since none but the Son of God and the bloody shed can atone for sin. Christian suffering is submitting to God in repentance from sin, in order to be delivered from sin, pleading for God's mercy through the blood of your through the blood of Christ, as one's means of atonement and forgiveness. To make such a plea without repentance and submitting to Christ's word, which is basically submitting to the Christian race, to keeping the entire package of Christianity, is to treat Christ's blood as an unholy thing and to do despite to the spirit of grace. Hebrews 10.29 To turn to Christ in submission to deliver you from your sins in, in hope of his atonement being applied to you is proper. And because Christ overcame as a man in flesh and blood to obtain our redemption, we can be redeemed to God, delivered from the devil's power, and be restored to God's image in him, in, in faithfully following him and keeping his word, the paths of righteousness. The Bible constantly relates Christ's race to make an atonement for our sins, with our need to be faithful to God through him, to actualize his purpose in us, to complete our own race of faith, and so partake of his redemption. Jesus is not only the Lord and Savior, he is also in truth the fore our, our forerunner. See Hebrews 6.20, to those who in truth turn to him as their Lord and Savior. He already overcame in his flesh and blood agony, which he had to faithfully um, endure to do the will of his Father. This was actually more stringent and arduous for him than anything we'd ever have to go through for righteousness' sake and following him. His race had the most at stake. His race had the most at stake, with zero margin for error, and he definitely never got to take one shortcut. First Peter 4, 1 and 2 says, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh hath, hath ceased from sin, that he, should no, that, he should no, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. Um, Jesus says in Revelation 3.20, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my Father in his throne. Is that speaking of salvation? Yes. He, Revelation 2.10 and 11, um, just, it's spoken to a certain church under conflict. But note the principle. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast of you in the prison that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Is there any alternative to receiving a crown of life? Yes, a second death. Verse 11, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be heard of the second death. And then you read Hebrews 12, 9 in the context of Hebrews 12, 1 to 9, which is speaking of the same thing. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father's spirits and live? Hebrews 5, 7 to 10. 
who in the days of his who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication, was strong crying in tears on the hymn that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Christ experienced and learned firsthand the details related to suffering in order to faithfully obey his father. Verse 9, and being made perfect or complete, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Amen. Amen. We see, uh, thank you, dear brother Aaron. That was fantastic and hit on so many points. We hit on the Godhead, the Trinity. We hit on how to be faithful, how to overcome. Amen. And and the, the day I came out of false Christianity, when I um, stopped believing that Christ Jesus was a um, covering for my sin um, versus a sin offering that I can go to, that in Romans 3.25 says, whom God set forth to be a propitiation through what? Faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remissions of sins that are past. Amen. Through the forbearance of God. And we see all these different types of once saved, always saved people that say Jesus is covering your sins for the rest of your life, no matter how you live on earth, etc., etc. Um, you know, we have um, heretics that say Jesus um, died a an actual sinner. No, Jesus, uh, Jesus became a perfect sin offering. And the whole Old Testament speaks of sin offerings, amen, to make atonement for sin. And now Jesus, the perfect Lamb of God, was offered up on that cross, amen, for anybody that can come to him and then live their life, as um, Matthew 10, 22 says, those that endure to the end and shall be hated by the world, but um, those that endure to the end shall be saved. So I'm paraphrasing, of course. So we um, understand that we must overcome, as Brother Aaron just read in the last few verses of his Bible study here, um, that we must be overcomers uh, of the wiles of the devil, of the world, of the temptations that are out there. And um, only one person did that from the day he was born until the day he um, offered himself up. Uh, and we thank dear brother Aaron for explaining that to us more clearly. Amen. Uh, as long as the Lord tarries, we shall see you next week. Remember, stay uh, on that narrow path. Walk as Jesus walked, First John 2, 6. God bless you all.